The Great Debate, part one. Now, this is not a exciting viewing video that's going to interest the people who are wanting to gain self-improvement. This is about the history of me trying to gain debate, the scientific process, getting my profession to follow the scientific process, um, and the hassles I've been to and the interesting journey this has been on. And I thought I would go through some of the letters and some of what I did. So let's wind the clock back to the late noughties. My father wanted to gain a, he was about to pay a lot of money to have a short film made about orthotropics. We had a patient whose father was making short films and dad was about to spend a lot of money on trying to get this short film going. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you could get nowhere. Another attempt to gain anyone interested in what was happening. So I thought, I will try to follow the scientific process. You know, I was relatively freshly qualified from orthodontic school in Denmark. And I thought, well, what we really need to do here is get um, debate, you know, push our push the profession, go through the scientific channels. You know, we should use these scientific channels and gain debate. And the key subject that I had, I'd realized, well, what the most important subject when I was studying was the cause. Because you, 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 these are complex issues and it takes more than a five minute chat to get this stuff across. And the key subject is the cause. You don't understand the cause of the problem, you don't understand the problem. So my, my thought was to work through the existing channels of science and gain a debate on the etiology of malocclusion, the cause of crooked teeth. So I went to the British Dental Association and I had a conversation with the editor of the British Dental Journal, a really nice chap, and he really you know, he, he gave me space in his magazine when others hadn't, or they hadn't given it to my father, particularly the British Dental Journal. We started this with an editorial he invited me to write. The editorial was called The Black Swan. The Black Swan, I wrote, chose that because the term Black Swan was used by Karl Popper. He said that, you know, Karl Popper was a guy that came out with a null hypothesis. He said, you can't prove anything, you can only disprove things. The example he gave was black swans, because in, us, in, well, in Europe, you know, if you'd lived in Europe a couple of hundred years ago, you could have convinced yourself that swans were white. It, it was a rule. It was always so. Every swan you'd seen was white. And you could, in theory, have scientifically validated this idea, swans are white turn up to Perth, Australia, and what you hit with? Black swans. So clearly swans aren't all white, and sitting in Europe at any time, you know, whether or not you see the swans in Australia doesn't mean they don't exist. So you cannot deduce by what's called empirical evidence, building up on evidence, that something is true. You can only disprove things. So I took that concept and that was the, the, my mark of respect to Karl Popper was to call this the black swan. I said, look, we've, 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 got, we've gained huge leaps and bounds in orthodontics. I don't knock it. You know, orthodontics has done a lot of good science. It's really understand about tooth movements, how we can give tooth movement, um, what rates you can get, what forces you can place on, you know, the mechanics of moving teeth. Great, 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 all great stuff. But uh, we've got some problems here. We still don't know, or there's no accepted cause within the profession of the problem, you know, cause of crooked teeth, not understood. Then we didn't know about, you know, what's going on with permanent retention, you know, because I said, there's no cure and permanent retention is now standard because it's what, what people recommended. You know, this, um, what was a campaign the British Orthodontic Society had, hold that smile, hashtag hold that smile. Then I said, there's no real, there's little evidence that orthodontic treatment provides a long-term benefit. You know, slightly cutting remarks. You know, I'm, I'm not here to be pejorative about my profession. I, I'm here, you know, science is supposed to be pejorative, isn't it? Science is about 
you know, you believe in the null hypothesis, you believe in trying to falsify everything. That's the nature of science. You know, I'm not being rude, I'm respecting you by trying to falsify your position, because that's what you should encourage me to do. Um, and I said, without this universal theory, it's the, you know, well, we, we need a universal theory. That, that's what brings things together. And orthodontic suffers from no universal theory. I go on to give some explanation of um, the theory. Of, first of all, I've mentioned Karl Popper, suggesting, you know, the the theory that best fits the facts. That's what we're looking for. You know, we can't decide on, you know, nothing's going to be perfect. Um, you know, we still really, I mean, people talk about the fact you can't actually, evolution hasn't been proven. I hear this term used, and in, in many ways, I guess it hasn't been proven, but it pretty much seems it's true, doesn't it? You know, the evidence, the, the weight of evidence, we talk use this term. So I then go on to give this explanation of, I think, what the underlying pathology, what I go on to call craniofacial dystrophy. And then I go on to talk about that malocclusion is a sign of civilization. That um, both the fields of anthropology and archaeology, malocclusion is considered a sign of civilization. You know, our ancestors had straighter teeth. Um, then I go and, you know, I go on to then say, you know, if theory, and this is the problem because people haven't stopped to give orthotropics the time of day. And, I'm, you know, clearly I'm, I want to, you know, I realize my father's frustrated. He would like to see more investigation, more, um, you know, people looking into orthotropics and what it can do. So I said, you know, clearly it's, it's difficult, you know, you couldn't listen to the whole theory of orthodontics at one lecture you know or one weekend even you know of lectures you know it, it is more in depth you know, you've got to hear something in its entirety to hear it properly and uh, you know i'm saying that you know it, it, it's 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 in a go i deserve to say it's an interesting theory i say that you know it would be best to have some theoretical test of this and as then going on to some clinical test saying that you know it should be for the universities funded by the public to investigate for the public good, if only to prove orthotropics wrong. This is what MSCs and PhDs are for. Well, for crumbs sake, I know from when I was in my master's, people were scraping around for ideas for every year. You've got how many MSCs? Well, I imagine that at um, the London hospitals, there must be 10, 15 orthodontic MSCs to fill every year. Yeah, you know, I'm sure. And that goes on every single year. And you've got to find subjects. Well, send one of them down. You know, it would be fascinating. You, you, I, I get so much headline press, you know, so much interest in me. Why can't you send one of those people, one of those 10? down to see me. You know, this letter was written in 2009. We're now 2022. So that's 13 years, 13 years times 10, 130 MSCs have been done. And I wonder how many PhDs, probably 20. And I think one of them could have come down here and done that. So I'm asking for these the theoretical and clinical um, investigation into orthotro orthotropics. But clearly I'm saying, well, what we should really do first is have a debate on the etiology of malocclusion. So I said that that's the crux subject. That's the baseline thing we need to start with. Because, you know, I'd like all the tropics to listen to. I've got, I've got lots of other concerns I'm not mentioning here. But, you know, they're going to sound high and flu. You know, it just sounds, you know, they're not going to believe what I'm saying. I've got to focus on this element first. I say malocclusion is caused by the environment when modify the genes. This is this is the actual debate I want to take them on for. So, you know, I want to engage in debate in a, in a way, I guess, as a scientist. You know, I'm part of a scientific community. I'm supposed to, if I've got problems within my, you know, I'm in a socialist system. We've got a well-managed, relatively socialist healthcare system. If I have problems, I should escalate that up to my line manager effectively. That would be the professor at the Guy's, King's, Thomas's 
King's Guy, whichever, you know, the big hospital, what, what would have been Guy's Hospital. It's based in the orthodontic department at Guy's Hospital. Um, and that's the area that you should research. That, that's the biggest teaching, orth, dental teaching school and probably orthodontic school, teaching school in the country. So I'm, I wanted, so I'm, and I think maybe if I want to debate, I want to engage with my, in my speciality that, you know, I would, I would go to, I would go to the orthodontist anyway. So I go to the British Orthodontic Society. I guess I'm a member. They're, they're my union. I should go to them. So I'm going to write to the British Orthodontic Society and trying to gain engagement with them. I'm setting out why I'm doing that. I'm saying that the, what I want to debate is that malocclusion is caused by the environment and modified by the genes. So that's what I've said in that article, The Black Swan. I'm asking for debate from the, from the British Orthodontic Society on that subject. And I'm hoping then, having gained that, that we might have some theoretical and clinical investigation into orthotropics. You know, I said that was fair, and we see which theory best fits the facts following Karl Popper's um, concepts. Now, then I get, so I then send the mail to the British Orthodontic Society. So I led a letter to go to um, the chair of the British Orthodontic Society. So I post it and I email it. So I email uh, an email with the um, article attached, as well as sending it via letter. So then I get the chair of the British Orthodontic Society right back to me. Um, I was impressed with the spirit. I mean, clearly he'd been putting a letter together already to respond back to me, but then, so very quickly he gave me a response back. So then he said, you know, the debate's an interesting idea, he says. He goes on to say that, you know, we know from the observations from the Mary Rose skulls, that's a ship that sank with lots of skulls on board. So they've got these old skulls to look at. That was Henry VIII, so what, 16 something, if I remember my uh, history well. And the plague pits, well, the plague pits were what, 1700s, weren't they? So these are older skulls, but nowhere near back in ancestral level. This is, you know, relatively modern, really. People living in cities, that's modern. And he said, you know, he goes on to say that, you know, and he says they've been teaching this, which is, okay, it's, it's interesting, you're teaching this, but you don't, it doesn't seem to have sunk in to the actual clinical application of treatment, which is a shame. Then he says, very little light has been shed in research as to what the environmental factors are. Well, that's interesting because, you know, I read, you know, Coroccini here, that's, that's published before this letter, probably nine years before this letter went in. So uh, clearly there are, but that's just, Coroccini is reviewing other people's and his own work. And there are the anthropologists are all saying it's, it's a lack of a tough diet. So that is clear and very obvious and very well discussed. My father's made many publications. A lot of people are talking about breathing. You know, this passionate of natal breathing. We're talking about Linda, Aronson, Woodside. Um, uh, Harvell's done his experiments blocking up monkeys' noses as well as putting uncomfortable things on the roof of the pallets of monkeys. So I'd say, I'd say, for someone who's considered to be highly knowledgeable within the research, I'd say that that's, that's poor, poor of you, sir. Um, I remember I was in the, I was actually on the committee of what worth that was of the Croydon Orthodontic Study Group. And we struggled to get more than five, ten people to come to a meeting. One day, this gentleman, the chair of the British Orthodontic Society, came down and we filled it up. And it was what, 40, 50 people turned up. Crazy. He was a big draw. He was a big fish in our little pond. But what interested me was that he was, um, they claimed, they all said, oh, he knows his science. He really knows his science. And he knew all these papers and was able to get the fine details of the papers. But he doesn't know what the factors causing malocclusion were. Now, that sounds strange. And, you know, all of these little details of how to move teeth. But you don't know the factors causing the problem that you're treating. Now, I, he feels my summary of the 
etiology in the editorial is very mainstream in its broad thrust. And I'm not sure anyone would argue against it. There's a revelation, isn't it? That's an interesting almost, you know, could I say throwaway comment? You know, he's, he's just, he put it in there. The, the, you know, well-known specific hypothesis about the airway is unknown. Well, I wouldn't say they're unknown, unproven, undebated, yes, but not unknown. Sorry, that's not true. He then goes on to say that my father was given this whole day to present this in Manchester a few years ago. No, he wasn't. He was given an hour. And I refer to this as the public hanging. Dad, um, uh, Francois Rousseau, um, Richard Dean, and I think one other person were asked to present some data. The professor at Manchester University had contacted Dad and a few others and suddenly offered to help them with some research. And they were, there was this rush on, almost this rush to get research. Then they were asked to present this research at this event in Manchester. Well, Dad thought that this was a proper um, offer of research. So Dad was getting these cases together with 30 cases, consecutive cases, and we were getting models, we were getting photographs all together for the event. Of course, at Manchester, well, we then just got going. And of course, we talk about the ugly duckling phase being at the f f year point, you know, one year in, 12 months, you're in the ugly duckling phase. And we were being asked to present the results of this work, and it was felt a little bit premature. So Dad presented the results of the work. That's what he did. Now, he only had an hour's presentation. That's not much to give. And here's saying the whole day present, John was equally at a loss to suggest a line of experimentation that may shed light on our ability to identify or influence an environmental factor. Was he at the same event that I was at? Dad presented how he was going with this research. That was basically most of the presentation. He gave a little bit of overview, as you would. And I think he, he gave a really good overview on exactly how he could influence the environment. And he was presenting the research he was doing, and he was very clear on the research that he would like to do comparison. So, you know, you... Anyone, any orthodontist, particularly a hospital, would be interesting, do consecutive cases. We do consecutive cases. We just compare the cases. You know, if, if your case is a bit more difficult or a bit easy, we're not looking. We just It's just a, a, a pilot study just to compare some cases. But now, when frequently people have agreed to this if we only show the teeth. But when I suggest we show the, well, my father suggested we show the faces as well, well, bye bye. But no, no, no. We're not willing to show the faces. We're only willing to show the teeth. Well, hang around. Uh, the objective of our treatment is to improve facial growth, hoping the teeth will be a bit straighter. The appointment of your growth is to classic orthodontics is to make the teeth straight, and yeah, hope the face doesn't get worse. I hope it gets better. Maybe I don't know, but clearly we need to compare both faces and teeth, and that's never been. A, agreed to, and we have been asking for 30, 40 years. So your suggestion, Mr. Chairman of the British Orthodontic Society in 2009, that he was, he was at a loss to suggest a line of experimentation that may shed light on... No, he wasn't. He clearly wasn't. And sorry. Then he goes on to say he was unable to offer a series of cases on his own. No, he presented at that meeting the cases that he was selecting. So that is an untruth. Then he goes on to mention Harry Orton, who had died several years previously, who had used one of my father's appliance, the Mu One appliance. He called it his own appliance. Basically, he lifted the whole of my father's treatment, went and claimed it to be his own, and headed off. I mean, 
<laughs> but I'm sorry. And that was a shocking piece of plagiarism. Shocking. And my father approached him and Harry Orton agreed to change his book to say, yes, he had been influenced by my father. A side story that Harry Orton's technician phoned dad up to say that Harry Orton had walked into the lab, dropped my father's book on appliance design down and said, yeah, make some appliances like that. Then went on to call them the Elsa and the um, MOA and a few other things. And you, did it, how can you, how can you let that happen? I'm sorry, that, that's just, it's not right. You know that that would happen. Okay, then he goes on to say, so the problem with the debate on genes and environment in etiology is that it is likely to consist of agreement that both are important. Then the putting forward of some hypothesis about environmental factors on which we have little fact to chew over and then an amount of shoulder shrugging. Oh, well, let's not bother. Let's not bother doing science because it might be a few shoulders shrugged. I, here's a scientist basically arguing against science. You know, he's a professor of orthodontics at, I think, what you would refer to as one of the Ivy League universities, you know, major university and teaching hospital. He's a professor of orthodontics, departmental chair, who's arguing against science. Anyway, then he says there's two hurdles on the issue of the hypothesis that orthotropic affects environmental factors. So in the 30 years in which I have heard John refer to it on many occasions, I have not gained a full working knowledge of what exactly it is other than use of functional plants. It's not actually, but they look similar. Yeah, I'll give you that look similar. And arch expansion and possibly some imprecisely defined orofacial exercises. Oh, these are those imprecisely defined orofacial exercises that have been shown to reduce sleep apnea by 62% in children. Meta-analysis at Stanford. Yes. And my functional therapy, you know, that's been around best part of 100 years. You know, relatively well defined by Hansen. Hansen, by the way, Hansen was published a long time ago. Um, he then goes on to talk about, you know, comparative research. Well, that's what we would love, that comparative research. You're talking about it, comparative research. Um, so the first point was that he doesn't understand what it is. And I'm thinking, well, well, we've got some books on it. What, what you know, what, you, you, you've learned orthodontics, you're a professor of orthodontics, so you, you know you need to do a three-year program to learn orthodontics, and probably some, you know, a lot of exams to get into the program in the first place. But you, you, you don't, how do you learn a subject? By coming along, by meeting the people, by reading the books, by reading the articles, it's all there. How do you imagine you've just wandered around in 30 years, you were supposed to gain this information by some form of osmosis, I don't know. Anyway, he so said that was the first problem. The second problem says, there's no one doing it. That's what he's saying realistically here. That, you know, he said even the Frankel technique, which he did himself, wasn't that affecting environmental factors? Earlier before he said, little light has been shed in the research as to what the environmental factors are. Well, that soft tissue balance, that was a possible environmental factors. That's what Frankel appliances were trying to affect. And you were using them. Saying here, found a you know, he used them in the 70s on a good number of cases. I wonder what that means. They found a significant following for a while, but clearly they were difficult because, you know, uncooperative kids, they don't like being changed, forcibly changed, that swallowing posture forcibly changed, although it's good for them. You know, it's like little kids don't like forcibly being not allowed to have more Coca-Cola or chocolate. That's a shame. Or forcibly being forced to exercise. Um, but challenge with orthotropics is the lack of adopters and therefore cases to match and compare. Well, all right, fine, but we've got cases to compare and match. We've been asking for this. That was the thrust of the lecture he gave the 
clearly you didn't pick up on. Then he goes on to saying that um, the hard, lack of hard evidence on environmental factors, you know, he talks about, it's interesting, he's talking about the, it's difficult in an individual or a society to intervene. Well, that's precisely what we're trying to do with the Prevent Crooked Teeth. Prevent Crooked Teeth, we please support the petition. That's the second um, link underneath here. But, you know, we could prevent crooked teeth. So then he goes on the final line. We're in good company. We don't yet know the cause of osteoarthritis, but at least we've got excellent, excellent hip replacements. Well, I will leave the viewer to make their own decisions about that comment. And... Watch this space. Well, I'll go into more of these letters and the history I did with this and what I did next. Anyway, thank you very much.